What is the perfect movie franchise? Does such a thing truly exist? The license to watch podcast sets out to answer that age-old question. Join comedians Matt McGregor, Harris McCabe, and Colin Shaw as they dissect your favorite film franchises one movie at a time. Along for the ride is a different film industry guest for every episode. Listen as the boys play judge, jury, and executioner and decide which of your favorite movie franchises are worthy of a license to watch. Hello everyone, Screenplay Archaeology host Kiramid Head here. Before we get into today's episode, I just want to get some intro stuff out of the way. First things first, we are now part of the Fandom Lib Media Podcast Network, so I'm going to link their site down below. And that's why you would have just heard a promo for another podcast, because they're another one of the shows on the network. And as per usual, if you like the show and you'd like to know more, you can check out our social media pages on Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, and even Instagram now. The show also has a Patreon if you're willing to gift money, but you don't really need to if you don't want to. And we also have a Discord server, which you can join if you want to chat with, you know, the group members there. So that link is going to be down below as well. So, yeah, sit back, guys, and enjoy the show. All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Screenplay Archaeology podcast. Episode 102, I believe. We've been going that long. I am your host, Kiermit Head. And I am Deus Deacon, returning after a long time. Yeah, after a long time, because I just stopped bothering you with episodes because you were getting (laughs) very burned out, it sounded like. Uh, No, I don't think so. I think it was more... I I would think I was more burned out on other things I was doing. But this is, this is, you know bit of fun really yeah it is a bit of work sometimes depending on the episode yeah depending on how many scripts there is to read as well yeah i've been doing my best to cut down on that for the most part yeah depending on the host like cthulhu jack likes to do the longer episodes so i'll do that with right him. and i also will record it in multiple sessions mm. yeah yeah and the conan episode was ridiculous i fully agree with you on that one yeah, yeah. I, lo- I look back at that and i go like these are different scripts for different projects in different phases of time. And I actually went back and looked at my episodes and looked at their length. Yeah. They were all pretty reasonable clocking in the most at like two fifteen, two hours, 15 until the Freddy versus Jason episode that you requested. Oh, wow. And yeah. then it started kind of expanded from there. <laughs> I'm tempted to go back and listen to some of these old episodes to see what I have to say about scripts back then. Yeah. It's, it'd be interesting to go back and listen to them actually. Like I was rereading Paul W. S. Anderson's Castlevania script. This is really bad. What exactly did I say about it in the episode? Which is hilarious because you requested that episode. Mm, yeah, yeah. And years later, I'm like, hey, the um, Warren Ellis Castlevania animated series is really good. You're like, oh, I don't care about Castlevania. Yeah, it's true. I think <laughs> I've just kind of, yeah, just changed my opinion a bit on it, really. Yeah. It was funny because that was one where we were like, yeah, none of us has played any games. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I, I don't have any of the nostalgia for it as well. Yeah, that's true. And so for tonight's episode, we are going to be doing we're going to be doing a Ghost Rider script. Now, we're not doing every Ghost Rider script that's out there. There's a few. There's a couple scripts and a couple treatments, and I figure I can save some of those just for later on down the line. And this one in particular we're going to be looking at is a David S. Goyer, Ghost Rider script from 2001. He actually wrote one in 1995, which is completely unrelated to this one, which was thrown out by Sony, basically, and then later brought back and rewritten into what became Spirit of Vengeance. Yeah, and you can pretty much tell that immediately from reading it. Yeah, it's pretty much the outline of it, where it's Johnny Blaze, Ghost Rider, getting recruited to look after this woman and her kid who she had with basically the Satan figure of the script, and her ex mm. is this criminal guy who's coming after them. And it all follows yeah. a very similar arc. 
it, yeah, it, it, the the overall plot is pretty much the same. It's it's more the the details that are different, and it can be quite different at times. Yeah. So, but we're not going to go into this too much. But before we get into the script, did you want to talk about Ghost Rider at all in general? Oh, uh, we we can do. Um, I'll mention I, I, I'll mention the comics briefly. Yeah, I I, I don't really have any sort of. Um, experience with the comics if i'm honest i have very little direct experience i've done yeah. like some wiki reading here and there i read a ghost it was it was a deadpool issue years ago where he it was a trade paperback where like most of it was a story arc about deadpool in las vegas doing dumb shit like deadpool does mm. and then the last issue that was collected and there was just completely unrelated it's deadpool in the desert he meets ghost rider ghost rider tries to pen and stare him and it doesn't work and it's kind of funny yeah and recently I read like the first four issues that he appeared in in Marvel Spotlight and they're OK. They're kind of rough. It's very strange seeing a ghost rider who's just kind of a pussy, if I'm being honest, like he's constantly running away from fights. It go like, no, I can't let people see me like this. Oh. But that's not Johnny Blaze either, is it? No, that's Johnny Blaze. Oh, is that Johnny Blaze? OK. Yeah. And he doesn't have the spikes. He doesn't have the chain. He wears a black evil Knievel suit. As you do. And his motorcycle is just a motorcycle. Uh, so it it doesn't do the whole transformation thing? No, it doesn't even turn into flaming wheels even. In fact, the huh. flaming wheels were a blaze thing later, but then the big hell cycle was a Dan Ketch thing from the 90s. And that's where Ghost Rider comics get kind of confusing is because there's there's like four or five different like major Ghost Riders and they all get their powers from different places, which makes hmm. you wonder why they're all so similar. And apparently it's all been retconned and changed to hell and back over the years to the point where it's like i don't even know what the hell to think oh so was that an intentional pun right there oh i did read um a graphic novel called ghost rider road to damnation which was yeah i picked it up because it was written by garth ennis and sadly it's one of his nah, not so great works i don't really remember anything about it right and i, I and then he did another one called trail of tears which is like a civil war story going all the way back to that era and apparently that's better but i've never read it all oh, right okay and i suppose i'll let you take charge of the ghost rider movies well yes i mean i've i've i watched them fairly recently but i may get some details wrong it's been a while since i watched the first one i've watched this i actually went out of my way to buy the blu-ray of spirit of vengeance yeah fairly I mean, recently I've, I've, I've seen spirit of vengeance very very recently so that's quite fresh fortunately uh, but yeah, the first one, the first one is very sort of, I would refer to it as kind of kid friendly in a way. Oh, I know yeah. it's, you know, it, it's a giant flaming, screaming skull, but a lot of it is very kid friendly, you know, because we spoke about this, you know, like Johnny Blaze, he's, he's instead of drinking alcohol, he has jelly beans. Uh, and he's like watching ridiculous, stupid videos. Yeah, which was um, all a very specific choice by Nicolas Cage. Yeah, yeah. Because his whole concept um, was if the devil could come for you at any time, you, you'd live your life like a like a dumb little kid doing stupid shit. Yeah, but I, I think, yeah. I can understand that, but... It, it, it doesn't, doesn't come mean, off in the movie. No, it doesn't. Uh, and of course, a lot of it is very... Uh, it's, it's not very well written because the bad guys, they, they literally, they, they show up, they're a struggle for a second, Ghost Rider figures out how to kill them, moves on and oh, that, he that's just, literally how it happens he steamrolls all of them yeah he does i mean he, he struggles for like a second but then he figures it out and just moves along and it doesn't help um, they don't even look cool they look like rejects no. from an emo band yeah the, the, all the, the bad guys are kind of shit and of course there was the whole behind the thing scenes thing with um i forget the actor but he was like completely coked out of his mind oh west bentley yeah uh he was he was just off his tits throughout the film apparently um uh, the, the, the thing that the, the, the biggest thing that I find kind of stupid is there's, there's a scene that's supposed to be bad where he meets this former rider and, and they, they, he says to him, is like, I'm going to use my power for one last ride. And that's, yes. that's all he does. They just ride across the desert and then he pieces out. It's <laughs> like, what the fuck hell was the point of that? What a waste of power. Yeah, he it's just, just completely pointless. They, it was so they could put that cool shot of them riding side by side in the trailer. Yeah, but I mean, he could have done something at the end. And 
I don't know if this is in the comics, but the the fact that he's like completely um, reliant on it being dark is so much so that even in the shade, he has to stay in the shade. Yeah, when, that's, when, when the it's in, it's inconsistent. It is very inconsistent. Like in in Spirit of Vengeance, it's a lot more well done. They they do it a lot better in Spirit of Vengeance. It's than they a, do it, in the it's mo- it's mostly at night, and then he gets like the power up at the end and goes out yeah. during the day. Yeah, which makes sense in the context of the film. Anyway, it makes sense. But in 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 the first film, it, it is literally oh, there's there's a shaft of light which will transform parts of his body, but not all of it, and it's just a bit weird. Um, and yeah, it's it's a very typical superhero origin story, even though Ghost Rider is not really a superhero; it's more of an anti-hero. Event. Kind of. It it depends. It, it does depend as well. I think it on, depends on who's writing him. Yeah, it depends on who's writing. Because I mean, in those original in those original Marvel Spotlight issues, it's not like a different personality or a spirit or anything. It's literally just Johnny Blaze. His head turns into a skull. Yeah, yeah. That the whole. Um, What's an alter ego? What's just him being possessed by this demon slash angel thing? Um, again, I don't know how much that is in the comic. Um, it it got retconned eventually into it is the spirit of vengeance, Zarathos, that is possessing yeah, so him. So that, that that's a, a thing, yeah. Which you know, in spirit of vengeance, it, it worked for the most part because um, they were consistent with it. Yeah, in the so, first anyway, movie, anyway. in the first movie, they don't even address it. No, there's that, there's yeah. there's literally one Nothing. line at the end where he, it's this awkward exposition line where he says, "I swear by the fire elemental within me" or something like that. Yeah, something that, like that that weird that weird Elvis voice he does through the whole movie. Yeah, because because that, because Blackheart's minions are earth, water, and air, and the implication yeah. is that the rider is fire, which is just bad. That's it's not great, is it? it it's generic. Yeah, but yeah. Enough about the first film. The first film's crap. Um, Sadly, it was not up to the level of his of that director's previous movie. Yeah, the but Dare, weirdly, Dare, Daredevil director's cut. Yeah, but but weirdly, we got a sequel, which is kind of a reboot. Bizarre. Yeah, sequel slash reboot, which for the better, to be honest. Um, and we've already mentioned how Spirit of Vengeance is a vastly superior film. Uh, oh, I. I, 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 I Oh, I know a lot of people don't agree with that, but I'm totally on board. Yeah, I, d- I don't get that. Even with I, the I, I issues, even is. with the issues I have with Spirit of Vengeance, which I do have a few. Yeah. Oh but yeah. It, it's still. I think it's a much more interesting take to me. It's it's a much more interesting take. Um, it's got a lot more of a sort of cohesive style. Um, the story has got a lot more stakes to it because let's be honest, there's actually not much happening in the first film. It's just Bad guy's gonna fuck shit up. That's it. The stakes Whereas, are that he misses his date with Ava Mendez. Yeah. And then they ended, <laughs> yeah, they ended that, up yeah, making, that is it. And they ended up making it up and just doing um bad lieutenant <laughs> later on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um but in like and Spirit Avengers, the, the reasons why I like Spirit Avengers is because um the way they made the rider look, because he's he's like charred and burning and you know the 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 jacket is like bubbling and melting. That that is really cool. The the motorcycle, it's a Yamaha V Max. I fucking love the V Max, um, and it's looks ri- ridiculously uh, over the top, but it should do. Um, and again, that's all charred and burning, and it and it looks amazing. And again, I mentioned this to you before: the fact that they made the rider creepy as shit, like incredibly creepy. There, there are times in Spirit Avengers where I'm like, "Whoa, that's kind of that's kind of messed up," and it's it's really well done. It, he makes him intimidating, whereas in the first film, that you're never really intimidated or kind of freaked out by the rider. When you should be, it's a flaming skull. You're laughing you know? at you. He's so silly in yeah. the first, like whistling for the motorcycle, which you can't do without whips. Yeah, exactly. Whereas in in the sequel, he's he legitimately freaky, and you know there are some really cool moments the fact that he he gets in that giant what is it that giant digger and turns that into a hellish version of that that's badass i forget what it was called it was like a, it was a this specific machine that's used to literally tunnel out the side of a mountain to, to strip mine. yeah and he basically turns that into a giant flaming chainsaw that's that's fucking badass um so there are there are some really cool moments in the sequel that i think completely 
blow the first film out of the water. Yeah, the sequel I think is is it's just much more fun to watch. I do think it's a little you can tell in places. It's weird because it both looks better. Yeah. Because the effects are like a million times better, but there's places where it feels like they maybe were feeling the budget. Like the first time mm-hmm. Ghost Rider shows up, he does jack shit in the movie. Yeah. And and there, there's no transition. You never see him transform from Johnny Blaze to the Rider, ever. You see his face bug out. You see his face bug out, but he never actually does a full transformation like he does in the first film. Which, looks which is really... a shame. Well, the way I they did it looked really, really cool. cool, though. Yeah. Um, now, well, also in yeah. that first scene, all he does is stand there. He bobs his yeah. head back and forth like a cobra, and then he penance stares that guy. And the interpretation yeah, of all that, the people there as well. Yeah. He, he just chooses that guy. Yeah. And the pen and stare is the interpretation is weird because mm. it looks like they ran out of money. Yeah. Like they ran out of money to put the effect in. Now, according to the commentary, Neville Dean and Taylor say that they wanted it to be more about psychological pain than physical pain, but it just doesn't play if that is true. Yeah. It, it is a little bit, you're not really too sure what's going on. And it goes on forever. Mm. Oh yeah. It really does. And also you have weird inconsistencies. Like he gets knocked on his ass and has to go to the hospital by one little grenade from a shot from a rifle. Mm. And then he gets hit with a bunker buster later on and he's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That is inconsistent. Um, It's very much, you know, what the script requires at this moment, kind of inconsistency. Um, But even then I still quite like that first scene with him in the quarry because it's like i said he's, he's creepy as shit and it's and it's still got a nice sort of feel to it um and it, it does kind of make sense because you know he's this is the first time we're seeing him in this film so he has to have a sort of an introduction and not do a lot because he's still got somewhere to go after that you know what i mean yeah um so it kind of makes sense but yeah i think they could have just they could have made it a little bit longer until we actually seen the rider and then just incorporate both those scenes together because yeah, they are essentially the same scene um you just you, you could actually put those two scenes together and it you wouldn't actually miss a lot um you'd and miss, it would make more sense you'd then. miss the scraping at the door <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. that's that scene's that, in the script yeah kind of that's that's proper a cage moment that um, yeah, and we'll go into a few more details as we talk about the script because there's mm. similarities and differences that are very much worth getting into. And oh yeah, that, that's one thing I wanted to mention as well because Idris Elba's character is not in the script, is he? I mean, you could argue, yeah, he's not. You could argue there's a character near the end who kind of yeah, fills his role, kind of. And there's another well, character, minor character, who kind of fills the Christopher Lambert role. But that was stuff that was all brought in by Scott Gimple and Seth Hoffman yeah. when they rewrote it. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, because the whole point of the film is that you've got Idris Elba comes to Johnny Blaze and asks him to do this, and then he does it, basically. Whereas in this, in the script, he just does it of his own accord. Um, which, you know, it's debatable whether which one you think is better, really. Yeah, that's true. Because, you know, you, you could argue, is it better for him to do it out of the goodness of his heart, or because this guy came to him and said that he could help him get rid of this curse. You know, how, how much of a self-centered prick do you really want to make him? Yeah. Um, and because the whole, and the whole getting rid of his curse scene is a little underwhelming in the movie. Cause it's literally, he makes yeah. his confession, he drinks wine and yeah. then he walks around in the tunnel, has like a trip and then that's it. Yeah. yeah it really is underwhelming. It's like, Oh, did, did that, was that it? That, that seems why, why didn't he do this earlier? What was, the point of that, it's, it's a bit, yeah, like you said, it's a bit underwhelming. To be honest, though, him getting his powers back is kind of cool. Yo, that scene is really cool. The, the, yeah, the, 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 the kid jumps on him and just breathes fire into his face. That's kind of cool. I like that. Uh, disappointed we didn't see anything like that in the script. But I mean, yeah, he doesn't even lose his powers in the script, does he? he no, he, he doesn't. In fact, that was something Neville Dean and Taylor added. Yeah, which I, I quite like. Um, and, and it explains how, you know, the powers changed because it was a brand new version rather than, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it, 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 they explained a lot of it in the film quite nicely that none of it really felt too contrived apart from the whole, you know, the thing with the, the grenade and all that, um, it all flowed quite nicely, but 
as you say, the Christopher Lambert character, completely useless in the film. It's a shame because I'd like to see Christopher Lambert do more stuff. Yeah, I don't think he actually cares. No, I don't. I could have sworn I saw he was going to be in something, but I can't remember what it was. I think he's just, he's just, he, he's taken the Highlander money and he's just doing what he wants to do now. He just doesn't seem to want to do much. Yeah, that's... I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he does, but it, it feels like he doesn't. I think he had enough of the crappy direct-to-video movies he was doing. I mean, who could blame him? Really? I mean, he, he lucked out in missing out on Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Oh, God, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> but no, um, so Ghost Rider as a movie kind of... Apparently Marvel first, you know, were, you know, looking to sell the rights in 1992. And there's a treatment. It's not dated, so I can't tell you where it comes into the, the, the process. But it's by Jim Shooter and Archie Goodwin, who were... Marvel guys like Shooter was an editor, Goodwin was a writer. And oh, I, it, I know Archie Goodwin because he was uh, a guy who would buy a lot of script. Because I, I know that because Warren Ellis talks about Archie Goodwin quite a lot. Yeah, he, he does. Basically, it. made Warren Ellis's career essentially. And it's I I've been talk I've been thinking about doing a Ghost Rider episode for years, and for the longest time I was thinking about just doing a couple of the scripts and a couple treatments all together. Hmm. This treatment is the reason why I kept putting it off because it's 24 pages long <laughs> and yeah. screenwriters and comic writers writing prose doesn't always go well. And it just mm. wasn't a terribly interesting script. It's Johnny blaze makes a deal instead with the devil himself. It's with this carny guy who's part of the carnival where they're doing their motorcycle stunts. And he's like a devil worshiper and he puts the demon inside Johnny and he's like the villain. It's like, it's kind of stupid. Right. It wasn't very interesting. And then the next thing that came up was in 1995, David S. Goyer, who writes the script we're going to talking about, did a script for Savoy Pictures. And that one was like very disconnected from the from like the Ghost Rider lore, like Johnny Blaze is born to be the host of the Spirit of Vengeance, who is a different thing from Zarathos. And there's like there's more monsters in it, which is kind of cool. There's like flaming hellhounds and harpies and stuff. And he gets like a Hellfire shotgun, which ended up in the first movie. Right. And it's it's not a great script. It's kind of dull. Like the Johnny Blaze character is more annoying than anything. Mm. Like he's very much the, but I don't want to be a hero type hero. Oh, Christ. I mean, to be honest, he if it wasn't for Nicolas Cage, there was the possibility of him being very annoying in the first film. Oh, yeah, definitely. So I can I can kind of see that happening quite easily. And so, yeah, that script, I don't know exactly what happened with it, but it's Savoy Pictures, and at some point in the 90s, either the, I think they got bought out and the new owners just decided they didn't want to make movies anymore. Because mm. I've read about how, like, they basically just shut down suddenly and a whole bunch of things got thrown into development hell because of that. I've read oh, about right. that in relation to other stuff. And then in 1997, Gail Ann Hurd was listed as producer and Jonathan Hensley was attached to write the script. And he's one of the big 90s action movie writers. Yeah. Who do Die Hard 5. No, not fu Oh, fuck off. Not Die Hard 5. Die Hard 3. <laughs> uh, that was I'm a familiar. horrible Freudian slip. Yeah. And I, and I'm, I am familiar with Gail Ann Hurd because she's done a lot of... Um... Uh, I, I've definitely heard that name quite a lot. I've, I've probably seen a lot of stuff that's been attached with her she produced both hulk movies i think yeah but i'm pretty sure she's done a lot of things with joss whedon as well that, oh, that's possible maybe maybe but yeah i just i recognize that name i really do but anyway sorry and it would be interesting to read a um a hensley draft just to see where he would have gone with it because mm. he, he's honestly a writer i really enjoy reading and yeah yeah goyer signed on again in 2000 and it was Crystal Sky Entertainment who who make the who made the two movies that did come out and it was scheduled and it was apparently scheduled to be made by Dimension and so with the Ghost Rider script the draft I chose for this was a it was a revision that's dated June 14th 2001 now I also yeah. have the first draft of it which is April something 2001 I went with this because I think it's a stronger rewrite. And I'll talk about like the ma there's like two major differences and like some smaller ones here and there. And I'll talk about the major ones. Now, attached to this was Stephen Norrington was supposed to direct whom he had done Blade yeah. and would go on to do League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and then quit. Right. 
And apparently Johnny Depp expressed interest in playing Johnny Blaze. That would be weird. It would be interesting. It would would be interesting, but I don't think it would work. Um, And yeah, I just... Yeah, I can't really imagine that working. Anyway, so And Avi Arad approached Eric Bana on the possibility of it, but then decided to have him do Hulk. Ugh, that was a bad choice. Yeah, I mean, I like Eric Bana. There's things about Hulk I respect, but it's not a great movie. No, it's a bit too uh, metaphysical for me. A bit too angly. No, Eric Bana might have been interesting as Ghost Rider. He could play the writer like he played Chopper. Yeah. <laughs> and so eventually Nick Cage heard that he had heard about Depp being a possibility, and he called Stephen Norrington up personally to ask for the role, and he actually got it. And so moving forward into the script, so I'm going to start with my notes. And so it opens on a coyote loping across a plain and up a ridge to look down at a small town. Well, a nameless woman who it's not hard to figure out who she is. Well, you say that, but throughout the script, I thought it was the oh, you did female character. Yeah, I was a bit confused by that. Was, okay, so yeah, I, 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 I figured it out. but mm, Yeah. And she's narrating about how evil only comes into your life if you let it. And it's the choices we make that matter. And she talks about how he was always running either to or from something he never knew which. And we then see a series of quick images, a pregnant woman named Roxanne on a beach, a sonogram, a car speeding through the rain with Roxanne in the passenger seat, then crashing when something runs into the road. And these images turn out to be dreams, and we meet John Blaze as he wakes up in the CD motel room with more narration about how our souls wander when we sleep, and sometimes our dreams are messages it brings back. Now, I'm going to tell you the big major difference now is that the the Johnny Blaze backstory in this, in this draft, it's kind of drip-fed throughout in flashbacks. In the first draft, it's literally like 16 straight pages of origin story at the beginning. <laughs> That's not good. I prefer this. Yeah, this is much better. And some of the scenes are in a different order there, actually, which is interesting. Right. And we see John's possessions, including a battered map, photographs, and a tarnished coin with a coyote on one side. Now, this is a big thing in this script. Not from comic lore in any way I can figure out. No, I I couldn't find anything about this either. It was just weird. It's added for the script. Yeah. And so John enters the bathroom and looks at himself in the mirror. And more flashbacks come, namely a younger version of himself sitting in an ICU with handcuffs on and Roxanne lying comatose in a nearby bed. And a sinister man named Ambrose Stark approaches John, asking him if he'd be willing to make a deal if he can help Roxanne. It then goes back to the present and John flips off the light. Yeah. Nice little introduction to to, to Johnny Blaze, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it, it sets up everything you need to know. Um, also... I mean, it should be obvious that it's it's a completely different origin to... The comics. The comics and the first film as well. But this isn't anything to do with the first film, so that makes sense. Yeah, um, and in the comics, it's not his father who gets cancer. Yeah. His father dies in a motorcycle stunt when he's a little kid. Mm-hmm. And Roxanne's father, Crash, who's part of the act, he raises Johnny. And then Johnny, like... It's this whole thing about, like, Johnny promises Crash's wife on her deathbed. He won't ride a motorcycle again. And then Crash gets sick with a unspecified disease. Ugh. And he's like, oh, yeah, but we need to still do the act. And Johnny's like, I can't do it. And they're like, you fucking coward, because they don't know about the promise. He goes like, I have no one to turn to. And it hard cuts to the next panel, him with his shirt off and a circle on his, and like a pentagram on his chest. Oh, yeah. And he's going, Satan. Bit extreme. Because but, in the yeah. in the early Ghost Rider stuff, there was no Mephisto. It was just Satan because they... Hmm. Because eventually later on, they had to change it because they got in trouble over it. Yeah, I can imagine them getting in trouble with a a few different circles out there. The whole Satan thing. And there's this whole thing how how apparently Johnny Blaze has just had random Satanic books on his shelf for years. (laughs) (laughs) And it's so funny. But I mean, honestly, that feels like the most Nick Cage thing he could do, to be honest. Satan. (laughs) I could see Nick Cage doing that scene. And the scene where, like, his dad dies when he's a little kid, Crash Simpson is like, well, since you don't have a mom, Johnny, (laughs) you could come live with us, or you could go to an orphanage. Yeah. And it's actually, someone at Marvel, when they were writing Ghost Rider later on, clearly read that, because one of the, Mm. what am I thinking? One of the retcons later on is that his mother was actually the Ghost Rider before him. Oh. And that she, she she vanished to keep Mephisto from going after 
So yeah, they took like that. So they took a, the idea. they took the hilarious line of "You don't have a mother, son," yeah. <laughs> and made it into something. I mean, you know, when life gives you lemons and all that, <laughs> and it, it cuts to a suburban neighborhood where the thuggish Billy Ray Kerrigan, who's he's just Ray in Spirit of Vengeance, but he's more rednecky. Yes, yeah. and his lackeys have Native American Travis Locke. And his wife, Catherine, tied up. Kerrigan wants to know where Travis's sister, Nomi, is and shoots Catherine dead when Travis won't cooperate. And he then threatens to be particularly brutal of Travis's kids before killing them, which gets the man to talk, saying Nomi is heading for Deadfall, South Dakota. And yeah. Kerrigan then shoots Travis dead and with some more narration from the woman, this time about how some people are born bad and some spend their lives trying to make up for it. We go back to John Blaze, who watches out the motel window as lightning flickers in the distance. Much now, more I effective. Admit, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, because you kind of prefaced this uh, script as being kind of darker than the film, that scene um, is a lot darker than oh, yeah. the film goes. Um, but that's pretty much it. The, the rest of the script is pretty much on par with what the film does. So... Yeah, I, I expected it to do more of that kind of fucked up stuff, but it doesn't really get any worse than that. Yeah, it's kind not... Kind of disappointed in a way. It, it's not like NC-17. Yeah, so... Sorry. Back, but, I mean, yeah. It, it sets up the character, and it, it makes him... It, it certainly makes him uh, uh, a lot more of a bad guy than he is in the film. Because in the film, he's just kind of a fuck-up. Yeah, he's just kind of a joke. Yeah, so maybe they needed that for the film. Yeah, I think they needed him. He He's much more evil in this, and this does a great job of setting that up. Yeah, which then plays into what happens to him later, I guess. Yeah, it does. And we see mm. more of his belongings, including pictures of Roxanne and a copy of the sonogram we saw earlier. And Blaze unfolds the map, and it's covered in lines, tracing storms from city to city, with Deadfall happening to be his current location. And I have to bring this up since it's Nicolas Cage. There is a Nicolas Cage movie called Deadfall. Oh, really? Where he plays a ridiculous... He's only in, like, the middle third of a 90-minute movie. It's mostly Michael Bean's movie. Right. And it's a terrible, boring-as-sin movie. It's just stupid, full of pointless celebrity cameos. And then you have Nicholas... Is it, is it one of those, like, you know, uh, director dvd kind of things he did? This was early 90s. Oh, okay. Never mind then. This was something he, he did because his brother co-wrote and directed it. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's uh, I've got it up here. Nineteen ninety three. Yeah, okay. But no, it's bore. It's this boring wannabe noir film, and then Nicolas Cage shows up for thirty minutes in the middle and is absolutely insane. Right. You, you've got to look up like a cut of like like a video of like some of his scenes from this because it's just he's just so. You look at what he looks like in the movie. It's like what? Oh, right. I think I I've, I'm looking at uh, the, the trailers playing. So oh I'm god. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he kind of looks like um that the the lounge singer that um Andy Kaufman used to play. Oh, Tony Clifton. <laughs> yeah, he kind of looks like Tony Clifton. <laughs> That's true. I'm sure the trailer isn't going to show the best bits. No. But um what was I going to say? Oh yeah. Uh so for this opening, um you know where it says uh where was it now? Uh he's tracing these things on the map. Yeah. I don't think it ever really explains or goes into detail about what that is or why he's doing it. It's he's because into... it's because storms follow Stark around. Is that it? Yeah, he's I never really got that. Yeah, because every time Stark is on screen, there's like a dust storm following him. Oh, okay. Yeah, I I never really understood that, and I guess yeah, I never really understood why was he bothering because it's not like he could do anything. What is he going to do? Fight him? <laughs> You know, it just seems a bit weird for him to be. Um, hey, if, Sh if Schwarzenegger can fight, forth. if Schwarzenegger can fight the devil and win, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, it, it just. Yeah, I, I think I, I I prefer the film version where he's just kind of hiding out and trying his best, uh, not really doing very well. But he's, you know, it, it. I just didn't like the whole. He's on this journey going back and forth across America. Just yeah, or just weird. wandering around, maybe. Yeah. If he was just wandering without like a goal, would you prefer that? I would, yeah, because then it 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 makes more sense because if if he's got a goal, then he's clearly not very good at it. <laughs> if he's been doing it for well, how long was it? Like 5 years. years. 5 years, sorry, yeah. Yeah, it's not, not that great. 
Hence, okay, yeah, so, anyway, so yeah, we then go to a 7 Eleven where Nomi is shopping with her eight year old daughter, Rain, who shoplifts a toy in full view of her mother. So we're getting the sense of her, the devilish side of her coming out. Yeah. And as they exit the store, they're spotted by Kerrigan, who this is basically, this gets replaced in the scene in the movie with Nadia and Danny, where he like pickpockets the guy. Yeah. In Romania. Because this is set in America. The movie's set in Eastern Europe, vaguely. Yeah, it's sort of a vague location. It's just, it's almost post-apocalyptic in a way. And then it's Eastern Europe, then Turkey. Yeah. But they're spotted by Kerrigan, who on the other side of the park, he's on the other side of the parking lot, taking a call on the cell phone. It's conveniently. Yeah. It's very convenient. It's convenient in the movie. Yeah, true. He says she came to see her dying grandfather and says the kid is with her. And he tells the person on the other end he'll bring them in alive, but they should remember the money they promised him. And he and his men pull away in a Bronco and a Tundra. Product placement? <laughs> Possibly. And we see two stray dogs fighting over roadkill. So a nice, I guess that's kind of a callback to the dogs fighting at the beginning of The Exorcist. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So Nomi and Rain are riding in their pickup, and there's a very similar dialogue that made it into the movie. Oh, yeah, that's pretty much pretty much identical for the most part. Yeah. They get rammed from behind, and we then go back to Blaze, who lights a match, and the flame bends as if it's drawn toward him, which is an effect they use in the movie. Well, that happens once in the film, but it happens like three or four times in this script. Yeah, so it's more because <laughs> there's actually a scene of it which they cut, yeah. Because one of the deleted scenes on, on the Blu-ray is he walks into a church, which is supposed to be his intro. He walks into a church and then the candles start bending towards him. Oh, right. Yeah. And, that and you kind of cool. And you can tell they cut it early in the process because the effects are clearly not finished. Oh, uh, okay. Like, you can see the friggin' like, square around the fire as it's bending. <laughs> yeah, and the flame, it draws on Tora. He picks up the coyote coin, turns it over, revealing an eagle on the other side. And he has another flashback to Stark offering him a deal, and we see Stark handing him the coin. And in the back in the present, Blaze sets the coin on the map and spins it as if performing some sort of ritual. And as it spins, it cuts back and forth to Nomi and Rain getting rammed off the road by Kerrigan's men. And Nomi tells Rain to stay in the car, grabbing a gun from the glove compartment and pointing it at the nearby truck, telling them to back off. Back the fuck off, specifically. Yeah. However, Lansdale, one of Kerrigan's men, and it only took down a couple names because only a couple of them stick around. Yeah, yeah the names are pretty much irrelevant for the most part. Yeah. He gets to drop on Nomi and disarms. Like He literally comes out and it's written as him just popping in out of nowhere and yeah. disarms her as Kerrigan approaches whom she recognizes. And so in the motel, Blaze shuts his eyes almost as if he knows what's coming. And on the roadside, Kerrigan has Nomi at gunpoint and we learn that they used to be... That they're married essentially, but they're not together anymore. And some of Kerrigan's Which... men retrieve rain from the truck and tie her up with duct tape. And in the film, were how because they they were together sort of in the film as well. They, they were, yeah. They weren't married, yeah. I don't think, but they were together. No, it's a bit more ambiguous. Yeah, because she was like with him, and he was like an arms dealer in that. Yeah, but again, he's. He's just a bit of a fuck up. And he has that terrible line where she's like, there are people after. He's like, I'm the people after you. Really quite cringy. And so at the motel, the coin slows and Blaze opens his eyes as his hands begin to emit a haze of heat. And I love the way the transformation is described in this. Yeah. It's it's so cool. It is. It is a very well done. I, I would have loved to have seen this actually in the film. Yeah. You know, give the movie a little bit more budget, Sony. Come on. Yeah. And as Kerrigan begins to beat Nomi mercilessly and sheds her blood, we and that's the whole thing with the catch version of the Ghost Rider is that he he the, is that the rider is summoned by the spilling of innocent blood. Ah, huh, interesting. And we see the coin fall coyote side up, and Blaze screams as his face erupts in the flame. Yeah, which is kind of what you felt like they were going for in the first film, but it was just goofy. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, blah, 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 where am I? Hold on. Kerrigan is about to shoot Nomi in the head when an eerie howl is heard, and the ground begins to shake before the Ghost Rider rockets in on his flaming motorcycle. And it Which goes again, up, yeah. in, in the film, that scene's really cool as well. Yeah, the sound like they chose thing. was really cool. Yeah, all of that was really cool. And it goes on the attack, grabbing one of Kerrigan's men and dragging him alongside the motorcycle until he's dead punches a hole through another guy's head and burns another to death with a burst of hellfire after snagging him with his chain. 
Which is pretty much what happens in the film, except less gory, Less stuff happens. Yeah. There's fewer guys there. And Kerrigan tries to escape in his Bronco with rain, and this was awesome. The rider uses its abilities to stop the combustion in its engine, and the truck oh, yeah. comes to a halt. That was badass. Uh, that was cool. That, that could have been something done in the film as well. He never does it again. Yeah, it's true. And so Kerrigan grabs Rain and climbs out, but one of his men, who's named Fusco, is still in there, and the rider grabs him, forcing him to look into his eyes. And so we do, we see various crimes of his, including killing Travis's children, and the rider's penance stare revisits his sins upon him tenfold, burning him black, but leaving him still alive with his mind destroyed. That's cooler than what they do in the movie. Yeah, because in, in the movie, he's just dead, basically. And nothing really happens to him. No, he, he just, he looks scared, and they stare at each other for a really long time, <laughs> and then he's just dead. <laughs> and it's just one random guy, too. I think he only does it, like, what, twice, maybe? He does it with that random guy, and then he does it to Carrigan later. Yeah, he does it at the end. It's not even clear that's what's happening because of the way it's shot. Yeah, and it's really kind of underwhelming. Oh, yeah. And in, in the first movie, it's we see the sins, and then, like, the guy's eyes burn out. Yeah. That weird scene that has Rebel Wilson in it. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. I forgot about that, actually. <laughs> and so the rider stops for a moment, looks over at Rain, who sees Blaze's face. And it's actually described, interestingly, that like even though it's a skull, you can still kind of see a resemblance to Johnny Blaze. Yeah, I, I wasn't too sure, though, if it if the script meant she was seeing him instead of the skull. Or... Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't really clear what she was actually seeing because if she was just seeing Blaze, then how does she know whether it's the Ghost Rider or not? It's, I don't Maybe remember. she's able to see through it because she's Stark's daughter? Maybe? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. It's, it's, I forgot what happened in that bit. So. Yeah. I forget how it's actually described. But, um, and there are moments where it's like his face is seen through the flames later on, but it's usually because he's weakened. Yeah. Oh, here you go. I'll just read the bit where it actually says it because it because the way it says it is is odd because it, it specifically says the Ghost Rider is somehow different to immobile internal. He then looks up past Carrigan right at Rain. Rain stares back, but it's Blaze's face she sees an abject abyss of pain and shame and torment. And Ray's, Rain's terror is forgotten for just that moment, replaced with something best described as empathy. Not, Maybe, not a bad description, but it's. Uh, I'm not too sure how you could put that on screen. And I'm not sure what he's getting at. Is it that she's able no. to see through the rider? Yeah, is, is she seeing the man? Uh, but is she still seeing the skull? I don't know. It's it's very ambiguous. She's bringing out the man. No, I'm not. I'm not going to do the Batman Returns dialogue. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway. But yeah. So Lansdale then drives the tundra into the rider, smashing it into a boulder, and this gives him Kerrigan and the final survivor Odell time to escape in Nomi's pickup truck. And Odell is the one whom we both said we were imagining George Costanza. Yeah. Because <laughs> of a specific, we'll know. Yeah, a specific yeah. scene later on. Yeah. And Nomi sees the rider hurl the wreckage of the tundra away and it looks at her like it's going to use its stare on her, but turns away and Nomi sees it reverted to Blaze from behind as he walks the motorcycle away. That's a cool yeah. image of him walking off into the storm. Yeah. And the whole thing about whether he used the penance there on her and, and that that's in the film as well. Yeah. Uh, although I don't think it's actually really elaborated on much. I think it's questioned once or twice. Like she sees the rider, the rider looks like it might attack her. Then it doesn't. And then Nicholas Cage actually has the line. He says, if the rider stared at you, well, what would it see? Or something like that. Yeah. There's a um, similar line in this, but it's directed at him. Yeah. Uh, which but that's I, it. Which I like. Yeah, it, it it's it makes much more sense for it to be directed inward rather than outward. Um, but yeah, it's it's not really it doesn't really go anywhere in the film though. And this next bit I think is a little bit better here too because in the movie he gets hurt by a grenade for some reason and he gets knocked on his ass and wakes up in the hospital. Here he goes to the hospital himself. Yeah, because this is what I interpreted as well as that he was getting shot as the rider which wasn't affecting him, but when he changed back into Blaze, that's when they started to affect him or something like that. Yes, because that's kind of what it does here because he, he walks into a hospital trauma ward and he tries to get medical supplies and painkillers as a doctor, tries to ask him questions about what happens. And so he, yeah. he takes off his jacket, starts to treat his wounds, which have already been cauterized. 
And so the doctor leaves to report the bullet wounds and Blaze just breaks into a medical cabinet and steals a lot of painkillers. Now, this is something yeah. which is weird. I don't know why shooting the Ghost Rider would hurt Blaze. Yeah, it seems kind of counterproductive because he's still going to get the damage. It's still going to kill him. So I don't get that. That's not invulnerability. That's just a delayed response. Yeah, in this, it's at least consistent because in the first movie, there's this weird thing where he takes all these shots and all kinds of things, but he gets stabbed under the arm once. Yeah. And Sam Elliott, as caretaker, has to stitch it up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is like, it's, what? Again, that's, you know, the first inconsistencies movie. with that film, yeah. <laughs> and this is a moment I really like, too. As Blaze walks away, he comes across paramedics working on a screaming burn victim, and it's what's left of Fusco after the penance stare. Oh, and yeah. Blaze is visibly upset by the sight of this. They, like, I, mean, I like the uh, fact that what he does has like a toll on him. Yeah. And he backs into a corner, gives himself a morphine shot, and finds he's leaning against the billboard with his own wanted poster on it. And about him taking the damage, maybe if it was just him feeling the pain of it. Maybe. As opposed to him literally having cauterized holes in him. Yeah. And it just makes me wonder, does it heal his jacket too? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And so... um he tears it down and notices Nomi watching him, recognizing him even without the flames as cops tried to talk to her about what happened. And I wonder if this is like an early version of the thing they did with the skull in the first movie where they literally scanned Nicolas Cage's head. Yeah. I mean, I did like that idea. It didn't really do much, but I did like that yeah, idea. It's a fun idea. Maybe, you know, not the best use of budget. And then they didn't do it in Spirit of Vengeance. So. Yeah. Because so Blaze walks out into the street and mails a postcard before having a flashback to him proposing to Roxanne, who makes him promise to be a good husband and give up his criminal ways. And then it jumps ahead to another flashback in a bar where Blaze's friends talk him into going along on one last job. So typical kind of stuff, but not badly written. No. And so Blaze is shaken out of his flashback by Nomi, who has approached him on the street. And she recognizes him as the thing that saved her the night before and wants to help him to help find Rain. He doesn't want to get involved, though, and tells her to get out of his life before riding off on his motorcycle. And Blaze rides alongside some train tracks as a freight train passes and has another flashback about the heist he went on with his friends, robbing a similar train while it was in motion and fleeing as the cops showed up. And what's interesting is that in the version where all the backstories at the beginning... This is a different thing. This is how he's introduced. And then the job he goes on later, you don't see. Oh. And he comes back and he has like diamonds. Right. Okay. Because because in the script, it's like just CD players and VCRs and shit, isn't it? Yeah. It's very similar to the opening heist of um, Fast Five where they drive up onto a train. Oh, right. I have not seen any of those films, so I'll take your word for it. I would say if you're going to watch one, watch five. And then, if you, <laughs> and then you probably won't like the rest. So just watch that one. Right. Because that's the one where The Rock gets introduced. I think I'll watch Talk, the superior film. <laughs> I still want that crossover. <laughs> Another motorcycle movie, go figure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he comes back to the present again and sees Nomi approaching him on a motorcycle. And Blaze tries to ride away again, but lets slip that that was him the night before. And he relents and goes along with her. And so they drive for a trailer atop a ridge. And Nomi, and they're like going to like a junkyard. And Nomi lets on that she knows the man he's looking for and that the thing he cursed Blaze with is called the Spirit of Vengeance in her native tongue. And she I didn't like the fact that they just completely just name check that just right out. The, they, 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 they don't even pretend. They just go, yeah, it's the Spirit of Vengeance. There you go. Because uh, in the film, it's actually, I think it's actually better where he, it's slowly, you know, they start talking about how it's a demon, but it's actually an angel. And the angel was like, did this, this, and this. I, I preferred the way it was done in the film. Yeah, the angel thing, I think, is original to the movie. Kind of. It was a thing in the comics where it's it's different in the comics, but it was uh, it's weird. I know there was like an angel thing there, too. You can you can kind of see where they got it from, though. Yeah. 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 So also another thing that's weird about this script. Now, this is something I never heard of before. So you'd have to confirm or deny this if this is an American thing. But. I thought Dakota was just a state. I don't... Why is there so much stuff about Dakotan culture? Is that a thing? Well, it's... The tribe is Lakota, and they're from the Dakotas. Right, so it's got nothing to do with the state. They're from there. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> They're from that. The, was... the, the Lakota Sioux are a tribe from that area. The Black. Oh, Hills. okay. That's right. You've you've confused. heard you've heard of Custer and the Little Bighorn. Right. Yeah. He was fighting the Lakota Sioux. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Again, I, I'm not American, so I don't know any of this. Stuff. North and South Dakota. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it was just a surprise that because because to me Dakota is just another. No offense to Dakotans out there, but. Yeah, it's just it's just a, another state. I didn't know it had this kind of specific thing. So yeah, it was weird. And she asks him, you know, if he dreams about the people he's taken, and Blaze angry replies that the writer does it, not him. And the trailer belongs to her grandfather, whose name is Henri Lafort, who understands English but refuses to speak it until Blaze gets up to leave, asking to see the coin. There's a line I thought was actually kind of funny where he says, "Hey, could we just fast forward the Yoda routine?" Yeah. That was a very cage line. Yeah. <laughs> and Nomi asks Blaze if he made a deal with Stark and implies that she did as well. And this is where we get kind of like the info dump. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a huge amount of uh, exposition. Yeah. And so Stark goes by many names, including Coyote, Black Dog, Trickster, etc. He looks like a man straight on, but looks like something else when viewed from the corner of your eye at twilight. It's in his nature <laughs> to spread chaos and evil. And Lafort elaborates being translated by Nomi saying that long ago he could change shape and chopped his body into pieces to spread mischief. And then the Eagle came along and scattered the pieces, which the first men mistakenly ate explaining why all people have a little darkness in them. And now Stark is out to collect the pieces back, but he has to work through human agents and the ghost rider is one of his tools. It yeah. sounds like a legitimate kind of folklore, but it's not. It's not. It's it's all yeah. made up for this. It's interesting. It's an interesting idea. It kind of yeah, I mean, de-Christianizes yeah. the situation. Yeah, that's true. It, it kind of moves it away from Satan and stuff like that and makes it more, well, it makes it more sort of Native American, really, doesn't it? Yeah, or like this guy is like the, the story behind all the stories. Yeah, so yeah. Admirable, I'd say. I think it could work for the movie. Yeah. And Blaze says he's been tracking Stark for five years following storms. But LaForte's like, you're going about it wrong because he doesn't exist really physically as we know it. He's a nightmare. <laughs> and needs to drive a car. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, again, inconsistent. Because it's like, because it, it's also implied that he can, because I, I, I thought he was the coyote as well. Because uh, cause he's always kind of shown with coyotes. So I thought that was him. I think it's it's him or it's one of his minions. Yeah, again, a little bit unclear, I thought. And so, yeah, he says the Blaze was only able to be host of this spirit because he was already primed for it by his own nature, which is an interesting idea. Mm. And the movie yeah. kind of flirts with that a little bit because he talks about how the deal to save his dad was not entirely altruistic. It was a selfish choice. Yeah. That his father was ready to die, but he wouldn't let him go. That's that's actually one of the best scenes in the movie. Mm. And he then asks Blaze if he would burn if the rider looked into his eyes, which Blaze doesn't have yeah. an answer for. So, like we mentioned. Yeah. And, and again, a, a pretty good line as well. And so Nomi and Blaze leave the trailer and she tells him she can't go to the police, partly because of racism and partly because she has a record. And she reveals that Stark wants rain because he's the father and Nomi made a deal with him to survive. And she thinks that fate brought them together, citing the fact that he followed a hunch to deadfall as proof. Hmm. Which would work a little better, like we mentioned, if he was just randomly wandering. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Blaze then warns her that when the rider comes out, he can't control it. And she just wants her daughter back, though, and knows Blaze will find Stark if they find her. So that's supposed to be his end of the bargain in this version. Yeah. Also, I'd, I'd, I'd love to know how many times or how, how often is it that the rider is depicted as a completely separate personality. And it's like almost like a possession. I think How that's. Frequent is that? I think that's pretty standard after a while. Really? Is that like? Is that more of a modern take on the character? I think the in the original Ghost Rider run, it was eventually revealed that the Rider was Zarathos. Right. Okay. So that's the whole uh, demon angel. Thing. Yes, and everybody, every single Ghost Rider character has that spirit that takes over, but it's a different spirit, which is just confusing. That. Yeah, that's needlessly confusing. Like the, um, okay. the um, fuck is his name? The Robbie Reyes version. The one you don't like because he has a car instead of a motorcycle. Oh, yeah, the the, the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah, he, his spirit in the comics is his uncle's spirit or something like that. 
Right. It, it's confused. I don't know. Nobody understands Ghost Rider lore. It's impossible. <laughs> I mean, I, we shouldn't talk about this too much because Marvel will want to reboot it. <laughs> but anyway. And we then go to Howardsville, Texas, which is getting pummeled by a dust storm. And we follow a coyote as it walks down the street past a car rental place. And as we continue yeah. to cut back and forth to the coyote, we focus in on a man's mouth as he speaks into a phone, talking to Kerrigan, who's using his cell phone next to a wheat field and has switched out the truck for a Hummer. And we get your favorite dialogue in the script. Oh, yeah. <laughs> where Odell and Lansdale are talking. They're both creeped out by rain. So let's read. Go to page the bottom of page 30. The bottom of page 30. Odell's line where it says it says exterior wheat field. Uh, yeah. Because he says, uh, I'm going to read Odell's dialogue. You can be yeah. Lansdale. <laughs> and I, I can't do a Costanza voice. Sadly. Oh, I don't. Yeah, go on. Okay. It's a creepy little fucker, isn't she? I guess. Like that girl in the Adams family. They misspelled Adams. The one with the big yeah. forehead. What was her name? Friday something. Wednesday. Name was Wednesday. Saw her in a movie all grown up. Got some big knockers now. Jesus Christ. I think that's meant to be funny. I, I mean, I don't really understand the joke. It's just I, weird. It's meant to be they're to, like, to... They're, they're stupid, perverted people. I think it's yeah, also meant they're... to give these side characters more dialogue so the actors have something to say. Yeah. Because in the first well, yeah, draft, it's... in the first draft, this scene is just Kerrigan talking. Yeah. It's just a weird, it's just a weird thing to, to yeah. point out. In this situation, too. Yeah. Yeah, it's very strange. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, in this context, the movie would be, it's got to be Sleepy Hollow. Um, because that movie's so all this, cle that movie is all cleavage. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, it, I think it would be. Where, where, when was this again? Two thousand one. This is two thousand one. Sleepy Hollow was ninety nine, I think. Yeah, so that probably would be the most recent one, I suppose. Um, because yeah. Burton set out to make a Hammer movie, and he did. He got the cleavage and the ridiculous red blood. Yeah. And it's not a bad film. Oh, it's my favorite That's Burton film. Either. It's my favorite Burton yeah. film. Yeah. But okay, so back to the notes. Mm -hmm. um, do, 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 do. Where am I? Uh, both creeped out by Rain and Kerrigan is too, saying he wants to hand her over as soon as possible. And is none too happy when the man says they're to meet in California. And then the phone call turns to static and Rain creepily stares at Kerrigan before looking over at an ominous scarecrow in the wheat. Ooh, foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. And so the man is in the phone booth at the rental place and he looks up to see the coyote looking at him. And this reveals that he is Ambrose Stark, whose name became Rourke, no first name in the movie. Yeah. I wonder if they changed it because um, Iron Man had come out by that point. I did wonder about that. Yeah. I mean, it would make sense. I mean, changing it to Rourke, it's a stark difference. <laughs> ah, sorry. Uh, Jesus. <laughs> and so he stares back at it for a bit before heading into the rental office and the man running the place, Jim Petrowski is closing up the place as a report plays on TV about the freak storms occurring in the area. And Stark walks in and uses the hours posted outside to keep Petrowski from closing early. So he's a Karen hmm, yeah. and they sit down to make the deal. Stark wants the Cadillac outside, but it's already taken and Petrowski offers him a Taurus instead entering in all the necessary information as his wife and son pull up in a minivan outside to pick him up. And Stark just painfully goes over the contract. It's like, if there's one thing I understand, it's contracts. Yeah. And it turns out that Petrowski gave him the Cadillac paperwork by mistake, which costs more. And when Petrowski offers to just knock the price off the deal without printing out a new contract, Stark throws him through the plate glass window in the front of the building. His wife runs to help him and Stark approaches, the storm getting fiercer. And coyotes lope out of the dust storm and surround them, and they begin to change shape as they lunge at the wife. The kid runs and hides. This seems pretty brutal, too. Yeah, it is. Because the guy's got a piece of glass lodged in his throat. Mm. The kid runs and hides under the rental cars, but Stark finds him, driving him right into the jaws of a waiting coyote. And there's more narration in this scene as well about how the world isn't kind or cruel, it just exists. A version of this scene is in every script. Yeah. And it was actually, and it was, and there was actually a version of it was actually shot and deleted. Oh, really? Except like there's, there's no storm, there's no monsters, and there's no wife and kid. He just gets like the the guy behind the desk just gets yanked off by an unseen force. Oh, that's disappointing. Because I mean, I mean, I can't really imagine it being that necessary in the film. Because where would it go? Um, 
I'd have to you... check the draft to see where it would go. Yeah, it it I can understand why they would delete it to be honest. And especially if you're not actually going to do all the brutal shit, which is arguably the whole point of the scene, it it just seems a bit irrelevant. And instead of the guy going, "Hey, I'll knock a few days off your thing," he goes like, "Hey, I'll throw a GPS for three. Because mm. he's Russian in that. Of course. Kerrigan and his crew drive through some badlands in the Hummer, passing the Idaho state line. And Odell, who can't sleep because of what he saw the Ghost Rider do, is bugging Rain and trying to make her eat a chip before Kerrigan tells him to knock it off. And Kerrigan tries to settle him down by saying it's a big country with tons of weird shit out there. Everyone has seen something. And it doesn't matter what that thing was, because all we have to do is finish the job, get the money, and we're gone. Pretty nonchalant considering yeah. it's a giant flaming skull. <laughs> oh, in the old Marvel Spotlight stuff, people see it and they immediately think it's some kind of glowing motorcycle helmet. Which is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and Rain speaks up saying it was the Ghost Rider and that it takes the souls of bad people. And this spooks all of them, including Kerrigan, but he tries to put up a strong front. And I will say this, it does make it clear why people would follow this guy because he does seem to have that, that air about him. Mm. And so back with Blaze and Nomi, they ride their bikes. And it's never explained where she got her bike from, by the way. Yeah, it just it's just there. Yeah, and so head, they're heading for a reservation casino. And this is a thing in America. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with that. And so Nomi says she never wanted to go back here. But Blaze says they have to check on Kerrigan's old haunts to try and pick up any clues. And so they reach the casino where Nomi says Kerrigan used to work as like a blackjack dealer. And she met him here, thought it was going to be your way off the reservation. And they get interrupted by Vince Rodenberg, head of security, who knows Nomi from before and refuses to say anything about Kerrigan. This is basically the scene where they find that guy in that weird underground nightclub and you get the scraping at the door. Oh, yeah. The the, the weird interrogation scene that's kind of just there. (laughs) Yeah. But, I mean, it's, it's notable because it has some of Nicolas Cage's amazing acting. And the effect of him... Getting skull eyes on his face is really cool. Yeah, that 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 whole sort of shifting of his face is is, is pretty cool, yeah. And so when Bla- Blaze tries to talk to him, Rodenberg goes off on how Nomi would screw anyone to help fund her drug habit. And so Blaze just grabs Rodenberg's arm and twists it around behind him, slamming his face up against the plexiglass box. And he twists his finger and basically threatens to break it until he says that Kerrigan stopped by his old house the night before. And so he breaks the finger, makes Rodenberg apologize to Nomi, and they leave. Yeah. So we get a different interrogation. Yeah, pretty much the same effect. And they soon arrive at Kerrigan and Nomi's old tract house, and Blaze can tell from the tire tracks outside that they switched to the Hummer here, so that is explained. Yeah. And Nomi's pickup was left outside, and inside they find discarded food containers proving that they stopped there for a while. And they enter the living room where one side has a hole burned through it to the outside. And Nomi starts to talk about her past. And he's getting like quick visions of the past as well. So I guess he sees crimes and guilt and whatnot. Mm. It's like Kerrigan used to beat her. And one night she deliberately overdosed on his own drugs as kind of an F you to him. But she actually did regret it. And Stark soon appeared, offering to save her in exchange for bearing a child that she would then hand over. And Nomi doesn't remember what happened right after that, but once Rain was born, she knew she couldn't give her up. Mm. And Kerrigan hated the child from the beginning, knowing she wasn't his, and so Nomi escaped, slashing his face with the beer bottle, giving him the scar that he has. And Yeah, that's not in the film either. Yeah, setting the house on fire. And she thinks that Stark sent Kerrigan after her as some sort of sick joke, on top of the fact that he knew her and would know where to look. Now, all that backstory in the movie is very condensed, it basically comes down to Nicolas Cage saying, you're the devil's baby mom. Yeah, pretty much. And so Blaze notices that a heat haze has started emanating from his hand, and that's when they notice headlights pull up to the house. Hmm. Rodenberg and four of his men have shown up, and they all surround the building, trapping Blaze and Nomi inside. And Blaze tries to fight back against the rider, but it takes over, bringing out his darker side. Hmm. And Blaze walks out and directly confronts Rodenberg and just shoots him twice in the chest. And then Rodenberg and one of his men, they drag off Nomi to the bedroom for an attempted rape, Ugh. leaving yeah. one man, Doyle, on watch. And then Blaze gets back up and the Hellfire cauterizes his wounds. He, he chases Doyle into the house, his steps burning as he goes, eventually grabbing and holding him as he turns into the Ghost Rider, burning him alive in the process, and actually apologizing. 
Yeah, it's kind of a cool moment. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff Ghost Rider does in this. Yeah. Rodenberg backs off from his assault as he hears the commotion, runs into another of his men, Weingrod, inside the house along with Pennebaker, and they hear Ryder kill the other man posted outside before he gets Weingrod with his chain and kills him. Mm. Rodenberg and Pennebaker run for their vehicles, but the Ryder snags Rodenberg with the chain by his ankle and hits the other with a blast of fire that makes him and the cars explode. And so the Ryder turns its attention to Rodenberg and its face flickers back to blazes momentarily. And Ghost Blaze, as it's called, asks Rodenberg where Kerrigan is headed. He doesn't know specifically, but says he's going to California. And then the rider takes back over and engulfs him in flames, killing him. And then recedes entirely, leaving just Blaze. Now he tells me he didn't have to kill Rodenberg as, she told him, as he told him what he wanted to know. And Blaze just says, I warned you what would happen. And they leave in Nomi's pickup as they hear sirens approaching. Yeah. Cool sequence. I'm a little, yeah. unde- a little undecided about the whole Ghost Blaze thing. Yeah, I don't really understand what they mean by that. It's supposed to be like his face in the flames instead of the skull, I think. But I just don't, I don't really get it because it's nothing specifically changes, though. He's still Ghost Rider. He's still the Ghost Rider. It's, it's, he's still doing the same thing. Why, why is he Blaze Ghost whatever there and not other times? I mean, later on, it's explained that it's because he's weakened. Yeah. But here it's just, I, I wonder, yeah, like I, said, yeah. I wonder yeah. if it's meant to be a compromise in case they get an actor who wants his face to be shown more. Maybe. Potentially, but yeah. But yeah, so they yeah. soon check into a Motel 6 with Blaze saying that the wounds will heal before long. He, he, he also mentions that he thinks he can't die because there will always be someone out there who's done something that requires the writer's retribution and that he spins the coin every night hoping that it will come up on the eagle side, meaning he won't have to change, but it never does. So yeah, the coin thing is strange. Yeah. It's almost more metaphorical of his character arc than anything, but we'll get to that. He lies down and goes to sleep, triggering another flashback. He bursts into his apartment and tells Roxanne to pack, and soon enough, they're speeding through the rain and Blaze's El Camino being pursued by the police. Blaze jerks the wheel to avoid a coyote that ran out into the street, causing the car to spin out and crash off the road. So it's implying that Stark set him up. Yeah, that's the implication. They never say say it, but it's a good idea. Blaze wakes up in the hotel, his wounds having healed, and he finds Nomi looking through his photographs of Roxanne, and he puts another postcard together, and they drive off in the pickup, with Blaze explaining that he made the deal with Stark to save Roxanne's life. He did, but she's in a coma and will probably never come out of it, and it's implied and stated later that they lost the baby. And we then go to Stark as he pulls up at a gas station in the middle of nowhere to get the Cadillac refilled, the dust storm having followed him. And we see the coyote creatures emerge from the storm, closing in on the gas station attendant. Yeah, he just doesn't seem to give a fuck. Yeah. Really? He just stops caring and just starts slaughtering people. Yeah. It's weird because gas station attendants aren't really a thing anymore. Really? There's like maybe one state where it's illegal to pump your own gas, and so you have attendants. Oh, okay. That's, uh, in the UK, that's, that's a very weird concept. <laughs> what, pumping your own gas? No, um, the, the, the idea that people would pump the gas for you. Oh, yeah. That used to be a job a long time ago. That's, yeah, very bizarre in the UK. Anyway. <laughs> very bizarre here. Mm. And so Kerrigan and his crew are still on the road in the Hummer the next day with Odell driving. Kerrigan, after seeing another foreshadowing scarecrow as they pass a field, gets a call telling him about what happened to Rodenberg and his men. And knowing that the rider is still after them, Kerrigan decides to recruit some reinforcements and Lansdale says he knows just the people to ask. And that's when Rain starts to taunt them about the rider coming for them. Kerrigan threatens her and it seems to make her cower against a car door, but she's really reaching for a pen that's fallen between the seat and the door. And she manages to retrieve the pen with some kind of telekinesis and she stabs Odell in the thigh. Making, making the car go off the road and slam into a culvert. <clears throat> and she then bolts from the car into a cornfield, cutting her tape on a piece of rusty farm equipment. And Kerrigan pursues, only to trip over the equipment and for Rain to hit him in the face with a rock, making him drop his gun. She pulls the gun to her with the powers, managing to wing Kerrigan with one shot, but missing the rest. And so Lansdale catches Rain with his coat, and Kerrigan ties her up and drags her off. Similar scene to what's in the movie. Yeah, pretty much. And so they make it back to the Hummer, and Odell has the line, which makes us think of um, George Costanza. Yeah, he's like, "She's lucky she didn't. She didn't. She's lucky she didn't stab my sack with that pen." Yeah, because as established in in Seinfeld, George 
says, I can't carry a pen. I'm afraid I'll puncture my scrotum. It's, it, it's a weird one. But yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I, I read that, but I, I immediately thought of Seinfeld. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, that's such a well-known line in Seinfeld as well. I wouldn't be surprised if that was deliberate. <laughs> Get Jason Alexander to play the character. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I genuinely wouldn't be surprised. It's not like his follow-up shows were going to get in the way. But, you know, it's completely wrecked. Kerrigan wants to find a place to hole up next day while they wait for the meetup. And Lansdale points out a shut-down rock quarry in the distance. And not wanting to walk all the way there, Kerrigan flashes down a passing minivan, flags down, I should say, with a family inside, including a kid playing a Spider-Man game on the Game Boy. Mm. So, God, that was a year away when this was written. Yeah. And, um... The, the, this scene as well it's that obviously they take the car and they take the game boy and everything but it's like did they kill them or just take the shit i think it's very clearly implied that they killed them right yeah because it's yeah and it cuts because the... like because like i said at the start it was very brutal and yet here they're being very sort of ambiguous and not being brutal at all so it yeah it's kind of got a tonal whiplash in a way also it's odell playing the game boy so mm, yeah George had to learn how to play video games. <laughs> and so they drive up to the quarry gate. They kill one guard. And why they have guards that shut down quarry? I don't know. But, and they tie up another while they wait for the people Lansdale called to show up. Yeah. And so it's the next night. By the time Nomi and Blaze come across the wrecked Hummer and using his past sensing abilities, Blaze finds out that Rain is alive and that they must be hiding in the rock quarry. Nobody wants to go in right away, but Blaze wants to wait until morning, not wanting to sick the Ghost Rider on them, despite her protests. And he warns her about crossing the line into vengeance and that she could end up with the Rider after her as well. Yeah. But this is all rendered moot when they see a gang of bikers riding up to the quarry gates, forcing them to move now. Mm. And the bikers are a club known as the Grey Gargoyles, and Lansdale greets them as they enter the quarry, introducing the audience to their leader, Arlo Skinner. And his twin brother lieutenants, Gunt and Chester Pulsifer. Now, I looked this up, and there is a Ghost Rider villain named Skinner, but he has nothing to do with this guy. He's a son of Lilith. Oh. He's a demon who's li- who lives among humans and all that. Hmm. And interestingly, Goyer also uses Skinner also as an evil biker in that other script he wrote. So he must just like Skinner. Yeah. And so Nomi and Blaze sneak into the compound with Blaze heading into the building to look for Rain while Nomi disables the bikes to keep them from pursuing them once they make a break for it. And while Blaze sneaks his way in, taking out bikers as he goes and he starts to feel the rider coming on, Kerrigan meets with Skinner in the office and negotiates, saying that they're only going to be fighting one man. Now, there is a similar scene in the movie, but this goes way differently. Yeah. And so Skinner and the Pulsifers laugh at the idea of a demon, but Lansdale assures them it's true. Blaze hides from a biker who tries to light a cigarette only for the flame to bend towards him. And in the office, the negotiations continue to break down with Skinner threatening violence and hurling a shocking amount of homophobic insults. Oh, yeah, I, I noticed that as well. Jesus. Like, that goes on for a while. Yeah, it does. And Nomi gets spotted cutting fuel lines, and Blaze, who seems to be being led by Rain using her powers, gets cornered by Odell with a shotgun, and things go straight to hell. The tense standoff in the office is broken up by the sound of a smoke alarm signaling the arrival of the Ghost Rider. A fireball erupts from the back of the building, giving Nomi time to stab a biker and bolt. Kerrigan and the others flee the building, and the rider exits soon after with Rain under his arm. Rain runs off as the bikers start to open fire, but the rider just takes the bullets and starts massacring them, taking a machine pistol from them and firing it back at them before it melts, which is cool. Oh yeah, that was another cool moment, yeah. And the bikers soon run for their bikes to make an escape, but they all blow up one by one. And as the building erupts into flames, Nomi's pickup crashes through the fence and Rain jumps in with her. And the rider catches sight of Nomi before they leave, though, and points at her, signaling his intention to take her as well. Yeah, again, it's really... They, they make a big point of it in the script, but it, it, again, it, it doesn't really go anywhere in the script of, as well as the film. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, it actually it actually goes less in the script than it does in the film for reasons we'll get into. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the Pulsiver brothers, along with Kerrigan, Lansdale, Skinner, and a few other leftover bikers emerge from the flames. And the Ghost Rider takes out the nameless bikers and grabs a hold of a bike and transforms it. It's Gunt's bike. That's, again, that's cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's Gunt's bike, and he attacks the rider, who responds by using a pendant stare on him, before riding back into the burning building and throwing him into the flames. And then the rider comes across the surviving guard and opens a hole in the flames for him to escape. Yeah. And Odell then tries to fight the rider by using a fire extinguisher on his head flames, but makes a mistake of fleeing into a storage room filled with explosives, which the rider explodes and kills him. I mean, that was just pure Looney Tunes. Bye, George. <laughs> and Nomi and Rain are fleeing in the pickup truck down the highway when the ghost rider shows up chasing after them. It uses its chains to haul the bike up onto the bed of the truck, which was badass, and then it reaches around and grabs Nomi's shoulder through the window, burning her. And the dawn soon arrives, though, turning the rider back into Blaze. And the chase isn't over, though, as Skinner, Chester, and five other bikers on their bikes are in pursuit, as well as Kerrigan and Lansdale in a Mack truck. I feel like this was this script's version of the big chase scene at the end of the film. Yeah, pl- plus... Because the, the, there is no big chase scene like there is in the film in this. This no. is the, probably the closest approximation, really. And the chase catches the attention of a state trooper who joins the chase and radios it in. And one biker gets flattened by oncoming traffic. And Chester fires a rocket launcher at the truck, missing it. And Kerrigan, who needs the girl alive, just runs over Chester with the truck. Yeah. And the chase continues into a roadwork area with Blaze shooting down two more bikers. The state trooper car hits a divider and flips over while Skinner rides alongside the pickup and tries to shoot Nomi with an Uzi only to get slammed into a concrete divider and die. So bye, Skinner. Again, pointless. And Lansdale jumps from the Mack truck into the pickup's bed and fights Blaze hand to hand, starting to win because Blaze is still wounded. And Rain, at Nomi's insistence, focuses her powers and makes Lansdale's glasses explode in his face, taking away his advantage. And up ahead, the police have set up a roadblock, and both trucks run over a spike strip. The pickup goes off the road into a cornfield while the Mack truck flips over and crushes a ton of police cruisers. And Rain and Nomi flee into the cornfield while the wounded but living Blaze and Lansdale are arrested. And Blaze, knowing what will happen if he's confined with bad men, pleads to be put into solitary, but the cops just shove him into a holding cell anyways. Which is basically the scene from the first film. Yeah, only it makes way more sense here, because in the first movie, they arrest him for basically no reason. Yeah, it's just an excuse to get the scene in the first film, but here it makes more sense. Yeah, they just happen to find his license plate on a junk pile and go, oh, maybe he knows something. Hmm. And so back on the highway, Stark approaches the burned Kerrigan, still trapped in the twisted wreckage of the Mack truck, and he gives the dying man a coin of his own and offers to make him a deal if he saves his life. This is where things get reordered a little compared to the first draft, because in in the first draft, Lansdale gets thrown under the truck's wheels and Kerrigan survives the crash and he ends up in the jail cell for what happens later. Mm -hmm. And so that all got rearranged. Yeah. Nomi and Rain soon arrive at a motel with Nomi admitting that they'll likely never be safe. Rain then talks about how her father sometimes speaks to her in her dreams and that she doesn't want to be like him. And Nomi reassures Rain, you're a good soul and hugs her. And we also see that Nomi's shoulder has been burned down to the bone, which is ugh. Yeah, that that was kind of brutal as well. And we see Blaze in the cell readying himself for what's coming. And then we go back to the motel as dusk descends and Nomi steps out of the room to buy cigarettes at the vending machine. And she has a flashback to her deal with Stark and then notices coyotes coming out of the dark, standing up on two legs and changing into their monstrous forms. And she runs. And back at the jail, Blaze cries out and Lansdale in a nearby cell watches in fear knowing what's coming. Back at the motel, Nomi reaches the door to her room when she hears Kerrigan's voice speaking to her. She sees his silhouette step out of the shadows, moving all wrong as if he was torn apart and sloppily pieced back together. And he also has bugs crawling around his feet and asks Nomi to give him the girl. And Nomi just shoots him in the head, but it barely phases him and she flees into the room. And again, this depiction of this kind of the demonic version of Kerrigan is so much better in this script than it is in the film. Yeah, in this version, he's like a variation on the Marvel Scarecrow, mm. but he's really more just like a monster that's kind of like a Scarecrow. Blackout so in, in, the, in the film, he's just silly. Yeah, it's just silly because he's just he's he's all white and he makes things rot by touching them, except for Twinkies, which is a stupid thing. <laughs> yeah, the Twinkies, and he can also pull the light out of the world. Which I yeah, think is he what does Black that weird sort of interdimensional thing. It, it felt like it was like a, a sort of pop dimension thing. It was weird. It was really weird. It's supposed to be like subjective darkness or something like that. Yeah. 
And I believe he does. He is able to turn lights out in the comics blackout, but I don't know blackout mm. that well. Still a better villain than the ones in the first movie. Yeah, true. That is true. And so as the woman's narration, just repeating bits from before kicks in, Kerrigan begins to slam on the door from the other side. The light bulbs in the room explode and his fist crashes through the door, causing the wood to decay. And as the bugs crawl in through the hole, Nomi drags Rain to the bathroom and helps her escape through the small window. Very shining ish. And into jail, Blaze starts to transform and the jeering prisoners start to become legitimately alarmed. And so at the motel, Nomi leaves the bathroom just as Kerrigan bursts through the front door. He grabs her by the throat and she sees his face, burned flesh, sharp teeth and buttons where the eyes used to be. And she screams. So this is major, major departure from the movie. She dies here. Yeah. And that, in the, that did surprise me as well. And in the first draft, because Kerrigan hasn't made his deal yet because he's in the jail cell, it's Stark who shows up and it's the coyote monsters that kill her. Right. I don't know which version you prefer, but... I mean, it, I mean at least it explains why the coyote monsters are there because they just kind of show up and don't do anything. Yeah, that's true. Um... So yeah, debatable. I mean, me personally, I would have just removed them entirely. Oh, the coyote monsters? Just have, yeah, just have Carrigan do it. Okay, at that moment, Blaze fully transforms to the Ghost Rider, and the burst of flame is so intense that a fleeing rain can see it from a hillside above the town. The Rider melts the bars of the cell with this fire and goes from cell to cell, burning all the prisoners, and it then melts its way into Lansdale's cell, and right as it begins to use the penance stair, Lansdale holds up the cell's mirror that he had pried from the wall, turning it back on the Ghost Rider. Now, in the first draft, it's Kerrigan who does this, and the ensuing explosion is what fucks him up. Here, it's not really clear what happens to Lansdale. Yeah, I don't really like that, because it's like, oh, is, is he Medusa now? <laughs> well, can't he just turn it off and on anyway? What does it matter? It's a bit odd to do that. But it's, a, it's an interesting idea. I guess. Uh, I don't know. It's just, it just seems a bit too easy. And so we then get a montage of the flashbacks with a little bit more added in. An ICU doctor tells Blaze it couldn't save the baby, and we get a little bit more of Stark offering the deal. And Blaze comes to in a cemetery, sitting up against an old grave marker, which this happens in the early comics, where he wakes up in a graveyard as Johnny Blaze. Yeah, but that, but that happens in the first film as well. Yeah, it does, because he crawls to his father's grave. Yeah. And he starts to remember happier, more pleasant times with Roxanne, and very nearly blows his own brains out, but can't bring himself to do it. And that's very no, similar I to. It would actually do anything. Yeah, anyway, sorry. it's very similar to a scene near, like right at the end of the 2004 Punisher as well, hmm. where he's thinking about his wife and he's about to kill himself. It's oh, yeah, it's yeah. very similar to that. And he's yeah. soon found by Rain, who tells him that her mother is dead and that her father found them, which is a continuity error from the first draft. Hmm. And she wants Blaze to continue to protect her, but he's now unsure of his ability to do that. And they catch a ride with some migrant workers who take them to a nearby mission. And one of the men working there, Tolbane, who's kind of the Christopher Lambert of this, tries to turn them away. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention as well. Sorry, just going back a bit. Um, one of the things that I found was a bit hokey is there is a specific line. I, I just buy it in my version here, where it says, um, if Blaze has been transformed into the spirit of vengeance, Kerrigan has been transformed into the spirit of decay. And I thought that was really dumb. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to put that. I mean, that wouldn't turn up in the movie. No. But anyway, carry on. Sorry. But you no, know, he feels like there's something wrong with both of them, but the priest, Reimer, overrules him. And Reimer is kind of the Idris Elba of this. Yeah, that's what I felt too, yeah. And so as Reimer offers him food and leads them away, he mentions that the place is a halfway house for ex-cons and Blaze is just, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> And the way to the kitchen is through the chapel, and Rain at first doesn't want to enter as the crosses on the walls scare her. And Blaze talks her through it, though, and they soon sit down to eat. Blaze dodges Reimer's questions about where they're going, and the other men in the room barely disguise their hostility. After the meal, Reimer notices that Blaze is anxiously watching the sun and asks him to help fix a generator. So they head down to the cellar and get to work, with Reimer saying he can tell Blaze is running from something, correctly deducing that Blaze isn't Rain's father. And he also believes Blaze when he says he didn't kill her mother and tries to offer Blaze a, p a place there. And Blaze tries to walk away and Reimer says, I know who you are. I've seen your face on TV and still offers to let him stay. But Blaze insists that he can't. And Reimer offers to look after Rain for him. And then he offers Blaze an old 70s motorcycle that's being stored in the cellar, saying he can if send I the may. money whenever he has it. Yes, you're the expert. Yeah, if I may, he actually offers him a 71 Norton Commando A50, which is... 
uh, quite a classic. I mean, th there is a very specific reason why they mentioned it in here, because somebody wanted this motorcycle, I can tell you that right now. Um, I'm sure they're, Nicholas they're Cage, very... I'm sure Cage would have tried to keep it. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you don't mention a motorcycle like that unless you actually, you, you want that motorcycle, really. So, yeah. Because, I mean, he, he, that out. he kept one of the um, replica cars from Gone in 60 Seconds. Yeah. So, I wouldn't be surprised if that was a very deliberate <laughs> reference there. <laughs> and, it is a classic motorcycle. Yeah. And as night arrives, Blaze, torn between the need to leave and his desire to protect Rain, looks in the bathroom mirror and turns the coin over and over, eventually staring into his shadowed eye sockets and says, this is the real penance stare, which is a good line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he watches the girl as she sleeps and then makes his decision, taking the motorcycle and leaving with one last look at the mission before he goes. And Rain, who has woken up, watches him leave from the window. And as she is drawn to the dining room by the sound of prayer, Blaze continues down the road, soon reaching the coast. It's like, oh, fuck, I ran which, out of America. I mean... Is that possible from where they were? Well, they were in Idaho. It depends on how Idaho. far they got. What? Uh, I guess. It depends on how far they got from from the Idaho border to the quarry. Yeah, true. I don't know. It's yeah, a bit. It was a bit too quick. Yeah, the geography doesn't quite add up. Hmm. And so back at the mission, Nunez, one of the men there, looks out the window and notices that the building is being surrounded by coyotes. And then the men start to think that Rain is doing this, a thought voiced by Tolbane, and he then leads some men out the front door and sees that about three dozen coyotes are now outside, which is very... There's a scene in the book Dracula where Parker steps outside the castle and is just surrounded by wolves. Mm. Kind of reminds me of that a little bit. Yeah. And one of them lunges at him and he leaps back inside and bars the door. And as the coyotes begin to slam into the doors and windows, Reimer retrieves a shotgun from his office. He tries to get the men to take Rain into the chapel, but they won't listen, wanting to send her outside. And something big then slams against the wall, then shambles past the window right before all the lights go out. So he's Again, got a little, is, bit of, a little bit of blackout powers. Yeah, but this is quite different to the film again, because in the film, uh, the, these monks were, were after the kid because they were going to, I don't know, either kill the kid or sacrifice the kid because they knew. Because yeah. in the film, it's established that Rourke wants a new vessel but in the script they never actually specify why he wants it yeah he needs he it's, it's that the kid will be a permanent vessel too yeah that's it and so kerrigan's voice is then heard calling for rain which only spooks the men further and reimer peeks out the window seeing kerrigan slam into the chapel's wall over and over again crashing through just as tolbane and nunez get the door to the dining room shut and kerrigan starts slamming into the door causing it to corrode and bugs to crawl in through the newly rotted holes you got to send some spiders after you. <laughs> and he calls for rain, and this causes Tolbane to finally flip out and forcibly take the shotgun from Reimer. He orders Nunez to open the door, and Reimer tries to stop him, only for Kerrigan to burst through the door anyway. And we finally see his form shown in full. Rotten flesh knitted together with burlap, straw, pieces of insects, twine, and razor wire. Buttons in place of his that, eyes. What? It's a cool depiction. Yeah. Buttons in place of his eyes bony teeth and black chitin for nails everything he touches mm. decays and it mentions that every mo movement he makes causes him pain which is interesting way to think about it yeah and, and again vastly superior to the one they got in the film who's just a white-haired asshole <laughs> yeah basically he summons a flock of ra crow-like razor birds from his chest and the coyotes now enter the enter behind him lunging at the men Kerrigan grabs men left and right, pulling them apart, throwing them away, or in one case, decaying him as bugs swarm over his body. And the coyotes then transform into jaw beasts, the two-legged creatures we've glimpsed before in previous scenes. Now, is that a reference to anything? Are jaw beasts an actual thing, or is it just something for the script? I don't know. I'm guessing it's for the script. Right, okay. It just seemed a very specific name. Yeah, and Blaze rolls his bike to a stop along the coastal highway, noticing how still and quiet everything is. He hears thunder and looks back the way he came, seeing thunderclouds in the distance, and turns his coin over and over again, wrestling with the decision he's about to make. And back at the mission, the survivors are down to Reimer, Rain, Tolbane, Nunez, who fall back into the kitchen and try to hold off the monsters. Nunez is soon dragged off and killed, and Kerrigan bursts through yet another door like the Kool-Aid man. They get backed up into a locked door they don't have the key for, and Rain opens up all the gas burners on the grill, and Reimer shoots the gas as Kerrigan passage, which hurts and temporarily staggers him. 
And we go back to the highway. Blaze is turned around and is heading for the mission. He takes the bike up past 100 miles per hour and transforms as he rides, becoming the ghost rider as the asphalt melts behind him and goes so fast as to create a sonic boom. And it's it's basically describing it as like he's embracing it this time. Yeah. And inside the mission, Kerrigan is back at it again, but he and the other monsters all stop as they hear the sound of an approaching engine. And we get a shot of the coin landing coyote side up. And that's when the ghost rider crashes through the wall on his bike, throwing it at the monsters and taking the razor birds out in the resulting explosion. The jaw beasts are still alive though. And the rider lays into him with his chains, exulting in the slaughter and setting the whole place alight. Pretty cool entrance. Yeah. Got no complaints about that really. Um, I'm pretty sure parts of that were incorporated in the film as well, because there's a few entrances that are kind of similar to that. Yeah. Definitely. Especially the whole riding really fast moment. I think that's that's in the film as well. Oh, yeah, it is. Reimer, Rain, and Tolbane make a run for it into the dormitory, but the windows back up onto a cliff face with no way down. Fire hazard. And Kerrigan crashes into the room soon after. Back in the dining room, Ghost Rider's having trouble with the jaw beasts, who begin to overwhelm him. He flees to a staircase and is forced to unleash a fiery shockwave. This is felt in the dormitory, but Kerrigan ignores it as he flips over the beds looking for rain. And this is very similar to a scene in Halloween H2O where Michael Myers is flipping over desks looking for Jamie Lee Curtis, <laughs> which right. flipping over tables in the cafeteria, which was flipping over desks in the schoolroom because it was a, a leftover idea from another movie. All right. He finds Tolbean first, decaying him and killing him. And then Reimer, who blows off part of his head with a shotgun. And then the Ghost Rider makes his way up the stairs, holding off the beasts with blasts of hellfire. Reimer shoots Kerrigan in the neck, only for Kerrigan to grab the shotgun and corrode, saying he can't die until he gets the girl. Reimer grabs Rain and runs into the bathroom, and we see Kerrigan's rotted flesh knit back together, as well as the fact that he's on fire, but too damp and moist to burn up, which is just, mm, you're thinking like dry rot and stuff here. Yeah, true. The rider continues fighting his way up the stairs as Kerrigan follows Reimer and Rain into the bathroom. He finds them and is just about to grab the girl when he gets wrapped in the Ghost Rider's chains and wrenched right across the dormitory, slammed into the opposite wall, which is awesome. Mm, yeah. Kerrigan recovers from the attack and sees that the Ghost Rider has been weakened by the battle, now in Ghost Blaze form. So yeah, that's a weird thing again. Yeah, here it is implied to be a, a, a weakness, but earlier it, it, wasn't. it wasn't. So it, it's kind of confusing. And so Kerrigan recovers from the, yeah, but I already read that Kerrigan attacks and the ghost blaze fights him off as best he can, but he's too far, far too weak. And Kerrigan gains the upper hand. He starts choking out ghost blaze, claiming that Stark granted him the power to kill him. Reimer hides rain in the hatch in the ceiling and ghost blaze starts to draw all of the fire in the building into him. Something Kerrigan is oblivious to. This brings the fire back in full, the rider back in full, full what was wrong with my mouth right now? Full force, supercharged even, letting a blast so intense it obliterates Kerrigan and makes the walls bulge. Okay, that was awesome. It, it, the act was cool, but the fact that Kerrigan is just like that, um, disappointing, but... Um, it's, at least a big, his... it's at least a big thing that happens to him. That's true. It's definitely, it's definitely better than the film version, anyway. Better than the first movie, too, where he just chains everything and kills it. And so weakened again and back in the ghost blaze form, he lies there on the blackened epicenter of the blast. Rain emerges from the hatch and feeds him a tiny ember. We don't see Reimer again, so I guess he's just dead. Yeah. The building finally starts to collapse and ghost blaze grabs Rain and dives out of the crumbling wreckage. Dawn starts to rise and Kerrigan, trapped in the rubble, dares ghost blaze to kill him. He's about to, but he sees Rain watching and for the first time is able to force the demon to go away. And he becomes just yeah, blaze yeah. again. He doesn't have the sort of the big resolution like he does at the end of the film. Because at the end of the film, he's like, oh, I'm actually a good guy now. And I have blue flames instead of red flames. And Which is a little confusing. Yeah, but so... I can feel the it, angel. So it's not as, um, you know, final and, as yeah. it is in the film. And so Blaze and Rain emerge from the rubble just as Stark's Cadillac pulls up in the drive. And he steps yeah. out of the girl saying he'll lift the curse if Blaze hands her over. And Blaze says he can have her, but we'll have to go through him. And then Stark takes a different tack, offering to wake up Roxanne, but Blaze won't go for it. He says, Blaze, you can't control the rider. But Blaze says he's willing to take the chance. And Stark goes, well, shit. And he decides yeah. to withdraw for the time being, walking away down the road, joined by a coyote, and he disappears over a rise. And Rain says he'll come. It. Yeah, that's pretty much that it. Really 
Rain says he'll be back, but Blaze says to let him come, saying he'll protect her. That's pretty much what happens at the end of the first movie, where Me- Mephisto just fucks off at the end. Yeah, and it's, again, it's incredibly disappointing. I think it fits better here because it's clear he's scheming. He doesn't just mm. scream like a little bitch and then, like, whirlwind away. True. And so as the woman begins to narrate again, this time about a balance being struck, we go into the wreckage and see Blaze's coin, which has landed perfectly on its head showing that he's balanced the two sides of himself now. Yeah, I guess. Symbolism. And we then go to a hospital room where Roxanne lays in the bed comatose, and we learn here that she was the narrator, her soul having gone wandering in her sleep, and that the postcards Blaze sent out were for her, and they're tacked up on the wall, and the police could have really easily found him through those. Yeah, true. And we see Blaze quietly slip quietly into the room and hold her hand for a little while, and then the scene of him riding his motorcycle. As night falls, he transforms into the ghost rider. Roxanne narrates about how there are evil things in the dark, but she isn't afraid because he's out there as well and will always return to her, and that's where it ends. Overall good? For the most part, yeah. Better than the first movie. I mean, yeah, that's, that's a little bit off. And I think it's about on par with Spirit of Vengeance. It's better in some ways. Other things, some things that movie does are a little bit better than this. Yeah, it, I, I wouldn't really say either one is better, just different. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think some they each does some things different. Each does some things better is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. I, I could see if you, if you took the best parts from the script and the film, you'd have the best of both worlds, obviously. Um, and you could easily do that because there are a lot of good parts of the script that could easily fit into the film. Oh, yeah. Absolutely easily. Um, but, there, and you know, they they could mix and match quite quite seamlessly, which which just shows how close the script is to the film as well. Yeah, for sure. So basically what happened with this is that it was at Dimension, and then right after Spider-Man came out, Sony bought it up. And then what Goyer has to say is that Sony didn't want to go for the R rating, so he and Stephen Norrington just walked. And eventually they brought in other writers, and they brought in Mark Stephen Johnson, and they made the first movie. Oh, one thing I forgot though about spirit of vengeance is that it was it was made under the marvel knight label wasn't it yes only two movies ever were yeah what was the other one i've forgotten punisher warzone that was it yeah yeah because they were trying to do a sort of uh marvel but it's like slightly more hardcore kind of thing didn't really do anything it felt a lot like um the dark universe or whatever the hell it was called oh the universal one yeah it was very similar to that it just kind of petered out after like one or two movies yeah, they it's made well, well, both movies bomb. Yeah, so Punisher Warzone, they delayed for months and dumped it out in December and it bombed. And yeah. Spirit of Vengeance was a February movie and that bombed. But again, Punisher Warzone's actually pretty decent. It's okay. For the most part. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, it's not brilliant, but again, a little bit like Spirit of Vengeance in a way. Um, but the, you, you could have... They're not, they're not the worst things to start with. You could have took those and built something even better upon them, like. Yeah, possibly if you, I mean, I, I have my thing with Warzone, which I'm not going to get into here because it's not a Punisher episode. But yeah, I see what yeah. you mean. Yeah, yeah. Another Seinfeld connection too, because Wayne Knight's in Punisher Warzone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, Newman. But yeah, I think we, I think we did it. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, so yeah, guys, hope you enjoyed the episode. And until um, next time. Yeah, take Bye. care, everyone. Bye. Bye.